Hello there, my name is Florian, and in this talk I'm going to explain how formatting f -sharp code in Rider works. You can see this in action in this video. I'm inside of Rider, I'm in Zen mode. If I open the action panel and search for that reformat code, and if you press that, then magic happens. Under the hood, a library called Phantomus is being used to achieve this. Today I would like to explain how Phantomus high level works, how I got involved in the project, and then how it's integrated in the f -sharp plugin for Rider. So first off, what is Phantomus? It's an open source community project that was started somewhere around 2013 and it takes F-sharp code and completely reformats it in a standardized way according to a given configuration. The project was started in 2013 by Ang Dong Fang and it was released both as a command line tool and a like Visual Studio, say, 2012-2013 extension. The name Phantomus is referring to a character from the fictional works of Pierre Souvestre et Marcel Alain there used to be this running joke that all open source uh, projects needed to start with an F and Phantomus is a beloved character by Ang, so that's why the name was chosen. Phantomus also has the same Greek root as Phantom, which fits the narrative since formatting F-sharp code can be a very mysterious thing. So to put it simply, all Phantomus does is it takes an input string and some configuration and it returns a string. But of course there's a bit more to it. Phantomus uses a library called the f -sharp compiler service. This is the f -sharp compiler shipped as a NuGet package that exposes different APIs from the compiler. So when you compile f -sharp code, um, a series of phases happen before you get from text to binary format. The f -sharp compiler service composed, composes some of these phases as a programmable API and they can be used by things like tooling, for example, to produce code completion. The APIs Phantomus uses are the tokenizer and the untyped abstract syntax tree. There are four main building blocks when it comes to transforming source code to formatted code. Um, one of them, the first important thing, is the creation of the abstract syntax tree. And then we, we collect some trivia and we map, we map both of those things back to writer events. Once we have those events, we can merge it back to a, a valid F sharp code. It doesn't necessarily happen exactly in this order, but you'll, you'll get the main gist of it just in a sec. So let's take the following example and see how those main concepts look like. The code we see here doesn't, um, doesn't have that much, doesn't need that much formatting. It's not that interesting, but from a syntax point of view, there are some interesting cases here. And while we developed Phantomus, we found it useful to create a tool that visualizes the different parts of the process. It helps us when we debug issues and we can easily identify in which phase something went wrong. So if I open this tool, we can see that on the left I have an editor which I can type my source code and then I have some tabs that describe every phase in Phantomus. Maybe if we first go to the last tab we can see that we have the formatted results where we can see not that much change but on line 4 it was uh, short enough to fit on one line so Phantomus put it all on one line. and if you see anything that's weird in the formatted results, we have this button here that says looks wrong create issue. If you were to click on that, this will open a GitHub issue in the Phantomus repo. And if I zoom in a bit, I can see that I have a preview here. All the necessary information for us to reproduce this is, uh, is already present. So this was the source code, this was the result, you can then describe here what went wrong. And we have the version of Phantomus here, we have all the settings that have been used. And that's really the way to report issues to us. So going back, um, first thing that happens in Phantomus is we create this abstract syntax tree with the use of the compiler. If we look at that tree, we can sort of uh, see this is an object model in F# -sharp because the F# -sharp compiler is written in F# -sharp where we can um, have a link to each expression that we see on the left. So basically we see that we, we have this type over here, then we, we have a type definition over here. This is a record, so that fits. The record um, is named format config, so we can sort of trace back every element that you find in the tree. And then there's page widths, there's uh, indent. If we scroll a bit, then we have this let binding on, uh, on line eight. So that's this one over here. There's this, it's named as T. So the T is then over here. You can see that our AST contains the information of the of the syntax of all of this, and that's actually our, our first starting point. Uh, we get the tree, we create the tree, and then we traverse the tree and try to um, write back the code based on what we found here. 
Now, if we go back to the slides, uh, one thing we notice is that we have code comments. So let's take a look at how that, that looks in the tree. If I were to select the first line, I can search for this, and I see that I have no results. So what does this mean is that um, code comments are being stripped when we create the AST. So if we go back to the formatted result, we see that we do maintain the code comments. So the lesson here is that AST isn't enough to, to format all the code. And that's where we use the tokenizer phase. So the f -sharp compiler will first tokenize the code and say which chunk is this what kind of token. So if I take this first uh, token, for example, it is the line comments. The first token is the three slashes. It is, uh, has the token name of a line comment. And we can also see that we have other tokens here, like the let keyword, equals operator, etc. So basically what we do in Phantom is we try to uh, deduce things that we call trivia that are not part of the AST, but that we can find in these tokens. If we head over to the trivia tab, we can see that if we look by trivia, these are all the things that we found in the source code, but not in the AST. So there's the first line comments, there's a new line as well, because those aren't really literally defined in the AST. We can sort of deduce them. Um, we can also see that we have this number here. If we look at the number, number is part of the AST, but this is like the binary format. And if we then go back to the AST, we can see that it already made an integer format of this. So that's not the same anymore. I want to preserve that. So that's where if we look at the end results, we took the value that we found in the trivia and the trivia based on the F sharp tokens. So we took that value instead. Now, once we have all these trivias, we sort of need to assign them back to what we found in the AST. So then we assign trivia to trivia nodes. And we can see here that our record, for example, has a comment after, has a line comment, and that's content after the construct. Uh, the let binding has a new line before it. So uh, we deduced it uh, like that. Then the constant is, well, the content itself is actually something else. So that's how we, how we piece those things together. And when we traverse the tree, we create something that's called writer events. Um, instead of having some sort of a string builder and printing everything um, directly to the output, we sort of collect instructions first. These are called the writer events. We um, do a little sort of event sourcing thing there where we collect all the events, which is most likely write this file, but also um, add some extra spaces, do the indentation, unindent, etc. And after we have all these uh, things together, we can actually construct the, uh, the results. So let's see this in action. Um, I, can, I have the Phantom solution open over here. If I were to go back to code formatter, this is our public API. I'll actually try and debug um, this. I'm debugging the example I had in my online tool. And um, the online tool is based on the same source code as Phantomus. So it is a uh, web application that calls some Azure functions. Those Azure functions then use the exact same code as Phantomus. So we should see all the same things pop up here. The first thing that we notice is that we have this format document. Our source string is the same um, as we can see. So it has the, well, it has the type, it has the binary value, et cetera. Then the next thing we do is that we use the F sharp checker. So that's part of that compiler service NuGet package. We use the checker to get the abstract syntax tree. Once we get that, we collect the trivia. So there's the tokenizer. Um, we tokenize the entire file as well. We find that trivia. We assign the trivia to trivia nodes. This happens over here. We can also see that we have a configuration. So I'll get to that in a moment. And then we start traversing the tree. The top level was an implementation file and Phantomus has a lot of um, compositions and custom operators. What we basically do here is that we have a function that has a context and it returns a context as well. And in that function, it adds the writer events. So then basically you put all these little functions together in a nice composition in an entire chain and that's how we walk the AST. At the end of it, we have collected all the writer events. So if I look in that context that's been passed on from function to function, I can go to my writer events over here. If I look at those results, that's, um, we don't have a tool for this. This actually works pretty well. 
but you can see everything we encountered. We're writing uh, stuff over here, but then we're also um, indent by four uh, spaces. So the four was based on the configuration. And then when we continue, we dump this into a string again. We have a results over here. And that was our formatted code. So in a nutshell, that's um, how Phantomus works. Now, I briefly skipped over it, but um, at the end, we, we saw that we actually could have multiple AST trees. And we can pass along the finds to our compiler that highlights uh, certain code paths. Maybe the easiest way to explain this is going back to the tool. Uh, I have oh, this piece of code over here. So this uh, hash if, based on if you pass foo to the compiler, um, the value of a will be eight, otherwise it will be 42. And from the compiler's point of view, you can also see this in uh, each phase. So if we look at the F sharp tokens that are produced from this code, if we just go with the default compiler settings, we see that we don't have a line tree here. So foo was false in that case, and it didn't even print anything out. I can enter my define if I were to pass foo, then you see that, okay, I have a line three now, but I don't have line five. And if I go to the output it results, uh, Phantomus actually was able to um, take both code paths and merge them back together. So the same thing for the AST. If I were to look at over here, I'll see that my constant is 42. So that means foo must have been wrong. If I were to enter my defines over here, I can see that the constant is now eight. So basically we take two trees. If I go back to the source code on the last, we take two trees over here and then we sort of merge them back together. And each time we need to make a decision, which code path do we take? We sort of take, well, the one that's not empty. And um, yeah, this can, be, this can be pretty challenging as in my simple example, I just had like one compiler defined foo, but you can also have some Boolean logic and there we have some sort of an expression solver that tries to determine all the possible code paths and it can take up to eight combinations, eight uh, trees and then merge them back together. So um, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff that we're also able to um, format the dead code, so to speak. The next thing, Phantomus allows for some user settings um, to determine how the, output it, um, how the output looks like. So in the next example, uh, we have this record over here. This didn't really change that much, but we see that we have a type over here. I can, um, I'm actually sneak peeking a new feature that's coming for the next release. I have the setting multi-line block brackets on the same column. If I put this to true, then I can see that uh, the way my type definition and my type record here was uh, formatted differently. So the brackets now align instead of um, being nested right to the next to the body. Um, this is an interesting case. So based on some configuration settings we can see over here, uh, some more obvious are the indentation space. If I try to put this to two, for example, if you were more into that, uh, you can see that the indentation uh, changed along the way. So we have some configuration that controls how the writer events uh, are created, but it can be challenging because when you, when you sort of think the, these things true, you need to take uh, all possible values in the AST tree into account. So it's not just about formatting how a record looks like. It is, in this case, it's a record based on the, on the type. So it's a type definition, but then on the next thing, it's like an instant of a record. Then a bit later, it becomes an object expression. So let's see, object expression is also over here. Uh, oh, some expression. So we need to take all these cases into account when you format the entire tree. Um, so that's why settings can be really tricky. And um, we're a little bit hesitant of, of introducing those because some have a clear scope, like indentation, you can't really do anything wrong. You just need to have to take, into, take it into account all over the place. Um, but for those record syntax, you really need to think it through. Where am I going to allow this syntax and not? Where I'm going to have different behavior? Um, but in a nutshell, you can sort of tweak these settings in our online tool. And then um, if you did some tweaking, you, there's this copy settings button, which copy settings. And if you were to use the command line clients, we'll get them to a bit. The copy settings actually basically copies what you needed in the JSON formats, which you can then use later on. 
So how does one use Phantomas? I mentioned it's integrated in Rider, and we'll get to that. But um, when we release, it uh, is released as a NuGet package to the library, DLL, and a command line tool. So in that command line tool, you can then use it um, you know, just to format with a configuration file. Or if it's in the library form, other projects can use it. One of them, the most popular example is FS Autocomplete, um, which is like the language service that powers the VS Code plugin. And then the other best example is Rider itself. So we'll, we'll get to that, how, um, how this can be used. First, let's just dig into how does it look like as a library. Um, I said, okay, the input is always a string and it, it returns a string. That's not entirely true. Uh, I have an example here when I'm just going to reference some DLLs. First is the F Sharp compiler, the second is Phantom as itself, and the last one is um, FSAST, which is a helper thing to let us uh, construct AST nodes. We're basically going to take this little snippet and try to create AST nodes ourselves. So this seems a bit strange at first, but what we're trying to do is we'll recreate this tree we see on the right here for this piece of code. So we're going to create a lab binding in addition. It has an A and a B, and it uh, sums them up. If I yes, go back over here, we'll take a module declaration, because everything in F-sharp needs to be in a module. We'll have this create let. So this is the FSAST there. Uh, we can you know, have some helper functions to construct this AST. We see that we have an input called A, B. We have a function name. Um, we have then the actual calculation which is an operator. So, well, I would say don't try this at home, but um, it is kind of interesting where this can go to. So if we look at this AST tree, it is exactly or more or less the same uh, than we had in our online tool. So um, the only thing that's really different is that there are, well, no ranges are, are matching here, but that's because it doesn't have any source code to go on uh, to create ranges. And if we were to then open Phantomus, um, I have the latest stable version on NuGet here. If I use the code formatter API over here, code formatter, that's like our public API. The most common things are like format this document, format the selection, but there's also this format AST. And if we format the AST, we actually can um, generate code ourselves. So that's also pretty, pretty interesting. So this is like the school example, but I also have something else in mind for this. If I have a little project SQL type generation, um, I have a database over here. So some simple stuff. I have a base database for the table users and the table tweets. Then, um, well, I just created some seed data, but it seems interesting to um, grab the table definitions and create some source code based on what I found in, in my database. So um, if anyone used Entity Framework like a couple of uh, versions ago, it's like that database first kind of vibe I was going for. I created the fake scripts and I'm going to use a, um, a NuGet package called Dusty Tables um, that's just to create some, uh, some SQL expressions in, in a functional way. Um, this is like the, the code we want to create. So I want to create a file where the type matches my user, um, my table. And then I have a get whatever my table name is, where I do a SQL query. And the column information and the type definition are just based on what's in my database. So if I, um, first of all, I do some little helper function to, to get you know just the SQL, uh, the table name, the column name, the data types. I get these things from my database. And I'm just going to generate code uh, similar to the first example we saw. We're going to create AST ourselves with the helper function again. Um, let's just see this at the end. So first we're generating the AST and then we're using Phantomus to format that again. And then we'll have our, um, our database file and then we'll, we'll see what that does. Um, look at the, the generated code over here. Um, we just try and get the table information, create an implementation file. Uh, then I add my, I collect for each uh, user table I found, I generate some code. Over here, I'm, I'm creating the type, the type declaration. So there was a user table, there will be a user type. There was a uh, tweets table, I think. So there will be a tweets type. And then there's this getter. I'm creating a Lambda expression to sort of get the fields. Um, 
this is interesting stuff because this it's, it's like a nice parallel to the feature that shipped in the C-sharp compiler or something in Roslyn where you have like plugins to generate code, but this will be like the equivalent and it's part of the F-sharp uh, community. So it was already kind of there uh, for F-sharp. So if I were to run this, I can just execute my fake file .NET run builds. No, need to go to the correct folder first. I'm just going to run this. This is my little application. It's going to create this database file. Okay, it already did, but I added a timestamp just for uh, reality's sake. And this just created code I needed or I, I have in my database based on my SQL file. And then if we were to run this program, um, it just gets the tweets by the generated code which just does a simple select query, but I didn't have to define this tweet type myself. It's just on, based on what it found. So that's also a very uh, lesser known use case of Phantomus where, um, where code can be generated. The Myriad project is the, the best example I think there that does the meta programming stuff and at the end also uses Phantomus to, to output uh, the generated code. So that kind of builds up to how does Phantomus then work in Rider. Um, the F-Sharp support in Rider was made possible by another open source plugin. There are two major components to that plugin. One is an IntelliJ uh, plugin written in Java and Kotlin, and the other one is like a plugin for the ReSharper host, which is the backend servers that powers Rider. Um, as you might expect, well, the usage of Phantomus will just be the ReSharper part that uses the DLL and then does the formatting um, like that. But uh, there's a bit more to it. And I would just like to show this in action because this is actually pretty cool if you um, download that package. If you were to clone the uh, ReSharper tooling for F-Sharp, you can just do this. Um, this is the, the uh, ReSharper solution. So this is really the ReSharper plugin. There's also the, the, um, there's also the, the, the Kotlin stuff. I'll, um, I'll just, run and sandboxed instance of Rider. So this is really cool. I can do like a uh, Gradle W run IDE over here, and this will start a sandboxed instance of Rider. So actually it's very similar to an early access preview. Um, it's gonna boot Rider and then later we can attach to the backend service um, to that process and there is a format over here in F sharp uh, PSI features. There's one called uh, reformat code, and that's the thing that's being executed when you, uh, when you reformat your F sharp code. So we'll get that same tree over here, and we'll create the Phantom settings. Then we'll check if there's a change, if um, a selection was made, or is it, is it the entire file? And then based on that, we can see if there are no defines, then we actually already have the AST node, so we can format the AST there. Or otherwise, we need to do that at multiple tree formatting process, and we can call another API, the code formatter. So I think this is running now. You may not see this right, but this is like version 2020.2 AEP1D. So this is really like a debug version. If I were to open that same solution file, And then let's go back and you can see that this is running. We can then go back and try to attach to the process. Now I need to be really careful which one am I using. So this is my C project, uh, Bright Ref Sharp support. That's my repository of the, the plugin I cloned. It is attaching to an already running process, which makes sense. So this is my uh, code over here. So this is the code I just I um, generated myself. But well, confession time that there's like this indentation, this pipeline. That's not nice, and that's because it's you. It was using an older version of Phantomus. This has been solved by now. So if we were to format this in uh, in the the sandbox plugin, uh, we'll get a better result. I'm just gonna wait just a bit longer until I'm really sure that it's all attached. And now let's just try this. So 
if I open the menu here, I go for that reformat code. Then we hopefully, yeah, we hit our breakpoint. Okay, that's good. And then we can basically go and drill down. And this is just like really cool that this plugin, this IntelliSense support, everything F Sharp related is just developed in the open. You can um, test out new features ahead actually if you want. We see that we, we're getting the checker service if necessary. We're just building everything up. We're getting the formatter. So again, I get my settings and I'll probably, I'm expecting we can format just by the existing AST nodes. These AST nodes are also like used for IntelliSense and code completion. Um, so that's why most editors already use the compiler for that stuff. That stuff is already there. So it, it makes sense to also use Phantomus. There is no range marker, so we're not going to try the format selection stuff here. There are most likely going to be no defines, as I'm expecting. Oh, there are defines. OK, um, well, wasn't really expecting this, but um, even if we're making new AST nodes with the compiler, this all goes very fast because um, the f compiler service NuGet package internally also um, is optimized for that. So it um, it will already have like a cached version if nothing is changed. So even though we are getting new AST nodes, it's already there's already some optimization in the background just by using the f uh, compiler as is. And then we get our formatted codes and I think I can show you this. Let's see, format it, formatter. Doesn't exist. Uh, let's change. I should probably be able to see this somehow. Mm. Yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm looking over it. So this is change. Okay, here we are, I think. View, yeah, this is the file that's being changed. So um, writer is gonna, gonna know by this change. I don't really know what happens after this, but it's kind of, a, the change was being like published. And if you then go back, then we can see that our um, pipes are, are aligned here. So we, we definitely formatted this this code. So it, this, is a, this is nice to see how that, how that exactly works. Okay, going back, I'm going to stop my attachment and stop the Gradle process. And we can go back to the slides. So I mentioned Phantomus uses those AST nodes, Rider uses them as well. Um, but actually, if you do all the cool stuff with Alt Enter in, in Rider, you're not modifying AST nodes, but you're modifying resharper nodes. And these are really like the next level. So they're initially created based on what's found by the AST and F and F sharp compiler. But the AST format that resharper uses um, handles multiple languages and it, it's really more powerful. There's a parent child relation. So you can like you can do more stuff with the resharper nodes and all the IntelliSense is like based uh, on, on those nodes. So it sort of brings up the, the question, will um, Rider forever use Phantomus? And the answer is a maybe, because they also have their own internal um, project structure. And it's going to be interesting to see if they can also like create a full, a fully functional formatter uh, with ReSharper nodes. Um, so, that maybe is a bit like a, like future music. It's a, it's a bit impossible to say at this moment. Oh, where is this heading? But uh, it will be cool to see if there are like two formatter solutions for F Sharp. I think some competition is good. People can learn from each other, and it will lead to some innovation on both ends. I think. Another part of this talk is the story of how I got involved in this project. As I briefly mentioned, I did not write Phantomus from scratch. I merely continued the great work of others, and this part is like a, the, the story of, of how did I get involved in open source and what's the road to the ownership here. Our story begins in a pull request in the .NET F-Sharp repository. 
um, someone proposed to migrate the code base of Phantomus directly to the F-Sharp compiler, which in itself is not a bad idea as Phantomus heavily uses the compiler to format the code. It makes sense to have that close to the compiler itself and maybe even part of the NuGet package. If it is part of the f -sharp compiler service, then everyone can just call it as the formatting service as they call the tokenizer, for example. Don Sign brought his feedback in this pull request and he basically wanted to only merge the code if it was possible to format the compiler itself. As the f -sharp compiler is, well, the largest publicly known f -sharp code base. So if you can format the most difficult thing, it's probably gonna be okay to, to adopt. Back in the day, Don held something called the um, f -sharp compiler hours, which was like an hour. You could ask him questions on the f -sharp Foundation Slack channel. And well, I was interested in this in this kind of thing, but um, well, I was pretty a novice at, at that point. And I asked Don any progress on this. It was like, well, it was right, definitely the wrong question. I was sort of expecting Microsoft to pick this up because it's, I don't know, it's Microsoft. I sort of assumed that it had like a, a army of engineers and Don basically said that it's up to the community to to pick this up, um, that the F-Sharp team has other priorities. And um, well, it was um, it was like a normal reaction, but I, at the time, you know, the man that had proposed this pull request didn't update, didn't keep this pull request up to date, and sort of the effort got ceased from his side. And some time after that, I enrolled myself in the F-Sharp mentorship program. At the time, I was like working on F-Sharp and the functional program for like a year and a half as a sort of a hobby. I was into F-Sharp, I was into Elm, and it felt like I understood the basics. It was time to move to the next level. Um, for those who do not know, the F-Sharp mentorship program is an effort of the F-Sharp Foundation where they try and pair uh, newcomers and more experienced people. You can like sign up as a mentee or a mentor, then you get paired based on a time zone and based on what your, your interests are. And then you have like someone you can reach out to and um, and collaborate. I was fortunate enough to be paired with Anthony Lloyd. He's a fine British gentleman with a lot of uh, expertise. He writes F Sharp code for a living. He's one of the maintainers of the um, F Sharp Expecto uh, uh, Expecto test runner. And we initially were supposed to, to start our mentorship thing. We were paired. I just moved to a new apartment and it took some time to get settled. So I actually almost blew off the whole thing. It was just one of those phases where I just didn't have the energy and the courage to, to, do, to do this. I postponed our first meeting, but a bit later, we, we eventually had our first Skype call. After introductions were made, the, the main question popped up. So like, yeah, what's the game plan here? And um, we didn't really have to tell up front, we're gonna work on this. Uh, we just had to generally give our interests and our time zone and then they paired us. So I told Anthony, um, yeah, I was like really impressed how, how F Sharp community really does a lot of things themselves. Um, it was quite the contrast when I come from a C Sharp background and I feel like there are a lot of people look at Microsoft and then stick to what they propose that you can do. Uh, but the F Sharp community sort of does things themselves and I wanted to be part of it. I wanted to contribute myself. And I told Anthony I had some interesting in the interest in the Phantomus project as one of the things that was really missing when I came from a bit more of the Elm side. Um, Elm has a great formatter. And well, F sharp and Elm, their syntax is just a bit different than what you're used to from like a C sharp or a Java. So it really helps that you have a formatter when you just don't need to uh, worry about how should it look like or et cetera. You can just, you know, hook up the formatter, it formats, and then that's the end of it. So that's why I took an interest in F-Sharp uh, in, in the formatting project Phantomus and looked at that pull request. And well, we, we started out by thing, simply fixing a bug. At the time, there were no like debug tools and I didn't really know what an AST was to be, to be fair. Um, it was very challenging. Phantomus also heavily uses active patterns and custom operators. And well, it was really challenging for me as a newcomer. It was pretty confusing as well. And truth be told, I was really in over my head. But yeah, we were able to solve that first uh, bug. But as I mentioned, the project was like having momentum in 2013. So it also had that still old MS built, um, MS built uh, syntax. So the, like the old .NET world be before .NET Core and stuff. So that's one of the first things we tried to do. Let's try to elevate this back to the new world. We wanted to move to that .NET Core experience. 
And we also update the F# -sharp compiler service because it was uh, it has been a while since um, that was uh, updated. And I received the NuGet keys for Mang. So yeah, the the first thing we were able to do was like have this first release of okay, this is now a project again. And it was an exciting moment. I slowly began to realize that hmm, I might be end up uh, maintaining this, but yeah, Ang was really happy that someone continued to work, and then uh, the source code was under his account, so we needed him every step along the way for a pull request review. But yeah, we we kind of did it. An all good project needs some some buzz to um, get the word out, so I, I wrote a little blog post. I uh, wanted to let people know that hey, we're we're trying this Phantomus thing again, and it's part of our mentorship program and. The news was well received. I was doing a nice thing and getting that first release out was a great closing to our mentorship program. I parted ways with Anthony and I felt comfortable enough to move forward on my own. I learned a great deal from him and both on the F sharp coding practices and on how to maintain an open source project in this community. So about a month later, I had the opportunity to go to NDC Oslo. Um, my employer recognizes the, the benefits of conferences and it was a, a great place to learn a lot and to meet some people. And somewhat randomly, I noticed that Don Syme was sitting in the hallway. So pretty nervous, I, I approached him and I told him, hey, I'm that guy and I'm doing things with that Phantomus project. And, and he knew the project and he was grateful and said, yeah, this, this is good, this is interesting. And we had a good conversation to say the least. And the, the lucky thing there is that he, he knew Ang he knew him personally, so he reached out and he said, hey, this guy wants to do more with that project, wants to have it uh, continue to evolve, and could we maybe move this from your personal GitHub account to the FS project? FS project is like the incubation space for, for new ideas that the community comes up with. Um, it's not the only space, but it's like a good organization. Uh, it has a lot of things. I think Packet is under there as well. And um, Ang agreed after Don reached out and I sort of learned that Ang isn't doing anything with F-Sharp anymore. And yeah, it moved to FS project. I got the administrator right, so I was able to tweak some CI settings as well and all is great. Now I'm not truly alone in this story. There's also another developer that contributed to Phantomus uh, from every, every now and then. And his name is Yindri Hivanik. And I'm happy to call on my friends and my partner in crime in this Phantomus project. We first physically met in FableConf Berlin in 2018, and it was really exciting. I mean, we were sort of two strangers who talked on a Slack uh, channel every once in a while, and we were working on the project, but since we physically met, things really kicked off. So I don't recall the exact order, but sometime, at some point on Slack, I asked him, hey, you want to be co-maintainer of this thing? And he said, yeah, sure, why not? He had a similar point of view where he said like, hey, I want to do something back for this F-sharp community and Phantomus was that thing. And it was great because he knew the project as well as I did. And, you know, we, we had like sparring partner there. When I got stuck, I could ask him for questions or we had Skype calls like, hey, how would you tackle this? And if you look at this picture, it's not Berlin, but this is Antwerp. Uh, one year later in FableConf Antwerp, we met again and it was like great to see how far we came, how good it was for the project to physically meet. Um, ever since we met, we sort of created this idea of this online tool where we where you can report issues that um, that gives us the enough information to go on. So this is an early version of the of the tool I, I had in the beginning of the talk and they used to be separate things. It was like an incremental uh, thing that we first had the formatting tool just to report issues, then we had the AST viewer, and etc. And uh, lately, we we just merged them together because every time the F# -sharp compiler NuGet package um, bumps, then well, we need not only do we need to take it to account in Phantomus, but also update each individual tool. And it was a bit of a hassle, so we kind of moved them together. But um, yeah, it was really it was really taking getting momentum. I, I feel. And after some good collaboration with Yindrich, other people were submitting pull requests as well. Um, I initially saw this nothing as, as good news. More people involved could only mean that there's more growth for the project. And I was a bit too eager. I kind of made a mistake by merging a pull request too quickly. The code looked okay. And the guy who, who submitted this, he had a unit test and then good intentions. And I definitely don't blame him. But 
we sort of introduced a, a new setting, which is preserve the end of line. And um, yeah, that, that led to a lot of problems and some were really like unfixable to, to get to say the least. And uh, yeah, no hard feelings, but someone I don't know merged some code I eventually had to maintain and it caused a lot of problems. So that I kind of learned something that day um, that I need to be more careful what I merge in. So what this setting did is that before the whole trivia story, we actually compared tokens. We took the original F# -sharp tokens, which would contain comments and, and everything we saw, and then the formatted tokens don't contain the comments and new lines. And then we sort of merge the two token streams together and try to have some sort of a result. That's um, that works in, in most cases, but there were just some things with that setting in, in mind that. If you didn't stick to the default uh, default configuration, it just never could have worked. So there's a there's definitely a life lesson there, and it has been bothering us. Um, we couldn't really move forward, and we wanted to get rid of both the the way the token streams were matched and that setting. And um, Yindrik talked about our problem to Don Simon at another conference, and he mentioned that well, the AST on itself doesn't have enough information, so. That's where they came up with that trivia idea, like what if we store extra things in the AST, like the comments as, as is, and new lines. And the idea seems very great. It was a relief that we could get rid of the token matcher, but it meant that we had to impact the entire code base. So this led to our first um, major release, which was a massive amount of work um, considering everything that transpired. So yeah. Both Yintuk and I were doing this as a hobby, so we we didn't really know when are we going to to tackle this. And I work for a consultant. For the most part, we do time and material where we support customers and existing development teams. So basically, we yeah have a lot of customers that do C sharp, and well, then I also have to do C sharp to support that team. And um, well, it wasn't all bad, but it just lost all the sense of wonder. If you if you go into that F sharp rabbit hole. You really you never want to go back. And one of the benefits we we have, of course, is that we can switch to new opportunities. I live in Belgium, and there are just very few companies that bet on F sharp. So our sales department had no idea where where to go, or didn't really have any leads. I uh, I follow the F sharp job channel in the F sharp Foundation Slack, and every once in a while, some job offer pops up, and I, I sort of you know just slowly check it and. Yeah, mostly it's not a remote position, and that brings us back to square one. And yet an unexpected opportunity arose. The people of G Research were looking for someone to invest resources and improve the F Sharp ecosystem in general. They have teams that use F Sharp, and they acknowledge that the state of the F Sharp ecosystem isn't always perfect, so especially if you compare like tooling to other languages. So they wanted to make a difference and fund some project or an individual that could pick up um, things that the team was currently missing in their everyday development. It was a bit of a long shot, but I reached out to them on Slack and uh, we came into contact. I explained my story and yeah, there, there seemed to be a match in what I, what I had to offer and what they were looking for. Because they have a strong opinion on how f -sharp code should uh, look like and a tool like Phantomus could be the right one for the job to uh, enforce it. The fact that I already knew the code base was also a very compelling argument, and uh, I told them about the well, the major release that was coming up, and uh, yeah, they, they definitely saw the benefits. So there was hope. After some negotiations, the research and my company agreed to a short contract, and one day in the week, I was allowed to work on Phantomus during company time. I was getting paid to write F-sharp code. And it was really the best experience in, in work I've ever had. It is something that you're so deeply passionate about. It doesn't feel like work at all. It's an amazing experience. It, it's, it's rewarding on so many levels. At the halfway point of the first contract, I presented to the team what my progress was. On the left, we, we see the team in, uh, based in London. And on the right, there's the manager of G Research. So they sponsor a multiple open source project. F Sharp isn't the only thing they bet on. and it was really helpful that I could reach out to him, to the team. They showed enthusiasm, compassion, appreciation every step along the way. Even when I had like non-technical issues um, or general open source questions, I could really count on them. And 
yeah, then Phantom S3 was was slowly becoming a becoming a fact. We um, yeah, we of course need to blog about these things, and from time to time I do blog on our company's blog, and I sort of have this rule of thumb where if I have the adventure during company time, I'm willing to put it on the company blog. If it's something that is was in my spare time, I might prefer my own personal blog. So it's nice to see that, well, there was a transition from my hobby to my company, uh, to, to work actually. Um, so even in, in those blog posts. So it became a work thing and well, my, uh, my work isn't concluded yet. So the refactoring that happened in version three isn't really sufficient for G-Research. Phantomus uh, follows the F-sharp uh, formatting guidelines by Microsoft. And if you look closely at the screenshots, these are based on formatting guides by Ang. Ang, who is the one who created Phantomus in the beginning. So the fact that we follow these guidelines is a bit of a self, um, is a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. So the guide Microsoft has there is slightly altered, but it really didn't require that much changes in, in Phantomus to, to adhere to the style. And well, that's also a bit the downfall that, well, this coding guidelines were created somewhere around 2019, but F Sharp has been a thing since, yeah, I don't know, let's say 2005, maybe, maybe 2008 publicly, who knows? Um, so yeah, it's a bit late to have a guideline, but it's never too late, but people have like other opinions on how we should format the code. And G Research was also in that team they have some other stylistic decisions where they say like, hey, no, we, we've been writing F-sharp code for years like this, and they sort of formulate it or they, they have their own internal style guide. And I asked them, hey, could we maybe publish that? And they said, yeah, why not? And then version four, which I'm now working on, is basically trying to have some settings where you can um, end up adhering to, to their style and guide. Now that doesn't mean that G Research is calling all the shots in, in the Phantomus project, definitely not. Um, but they have really, they have been doing this for years. They have an opinion, they have like an idea on if we have this setting, where does it apply? Like the example I gave for the records, they really could say, oh yeah, but it happens there, there, and there, and there. And if you then look at it from an AST point of view, it was always pretty complete. So that's why these settings they asked kind of were in, easy to, um, to align because you perfectly knew where the setting starts and where it ends. Um, but it was all just based on a, a community effort. Like, hey, we want people to have the possibility to format um, to format as, as we do it. And by doing that investment, they sort of improved Phantomus as a whole because I'm, I've been working towards their formatting conventions, but obviously just fixing bugs for everyone. If they report a bug and I fix it, it's yeah, it's a fix for everyone. So there is, um, there's definitely very good, good things coming out of this. And there is an alpha of the version four. So that's not in Rider yet. Um, because well, Rider has a, has a fork of Phantomus. They have a slightly different version of the compiler. So they sync every once in a while before a, a big release. So, um, you don't get the latest and greatest within Rider, but that's also a good thing because, well, every new version tends to have a little slip up here and there. So Rider always depends more on a more stable version. And yeah, version four is looking promising and I, I feel really supreme at this point. I've reached that, that point where I have like all the knowledge and I feel like I can tackle every problem whatsoever. Um, and well, that's, Great, but that's also a bit of the part of the problem. Um, there's only like two people who know the entire code base and that's a bit problematic. If I want to take a break from Phantomus, it will appear that Phantomus takes a break as well. And that's not really what I want. Um, one man armies don't scale that well. So for that reason, we can never cover enough ground with the, the people involved in the project right now. So we should try and pursue um, other people to have uh, a look at Phantomus as well and maybe um, consider fixing their own bug. So um, yeah, it shouldn't be a one-man show. That's always a bad idea. So in that case, I kind of want to uh, grow beyond that and maybe pursue even other ambitions. So I definitely want to take a stab at some uh, writer tooling at some point because that's, that's also very interesting stuff. So I want to be more than the Phantomus guy. And 
That's why um, this year I had this idea of the road to adoption. It is a very fancy name just to get more people involved, both in using the tool and then reporting bugs and also contributing. But I created a YouTube channel where I made um, detailed videos of how does this work? And most of these start with a problem that we see and, and the first episode, okay, there's just a problem in the AST, something we misinterpret. And then we slowly move on, like how are those uh, contexts, how are those functions chained together? Then, then there's the trivia, what the devil is that? And it's becoming a sort of a form of documentation, which is lightly digestible. And I've been working hard on getting knowledge, uh, knowledge sharing of how, how the tool exactly works. Because give a man a fish and you can feed him for a day and teach a man to fish, you, you can feed him for a lifetime. So I, I really wanna teach people how to solve their own problems if they might occur, uh, if they might have some with, with Phantomus. So I really want to go from one man on the top to a real herd that the F-Sharp community comes together. We can cover so much more ground. And it's, it's actually interesting to see because last week um, I sort of asked someone who created an issue. I said, hey, I looked at the online tool. This is going wrong over there and over there. If you watch this video, you might have a notion of what to do. Would you be interested in solving this yourself? And well, I created a couple of those um, of those summaries of, of how it should be solved. And some people say, yeah, sure, why not? Uh, I, I looked at the video, it, it's kind of clear to me what to do. And they just, with a bit of my guidance, they were able to solve their own problem, which is like really an interesting, interesting uh, take here because it, it's, very slowly we're getting to that picture that we're, we're starting to get a herd and we'll, we'll be able to cover that much more ground. So the key takeaways of this, this last part of the story is that everything can pick up a complex project. I, I went from hero uh, from zero to hero when it comes to this. I, I knew nothing about the F-Sharp compiler um, back when I started and now I can say I know a thing or two. Um, Goodwill and enthusiasm are fine, but sometimes you really need that extra push in the back when tackling complex things. And G Research really was able to provide me that. So it's uh, nothing but gratitude for that. And next to the technical things that went over this, I, I also overcame some of those personal challenges. Um, this talk is, an, is a nice example. It really motivates me to, you know, to step up and then try and uh, and get the message out. And so the road is, is still a long one. I, I hope that Phantomus can one day be stable enough and really format that F-sharp compiler because that will be the, the destination, uh, so to say, and it can go to the F-sharp compiler itself and that's still the dream. So it has been an incredible journey. Um, to wrap up, just a bit about me. I am Florian. Uh, I work at a company called Axis. You can find me on Twitter or on GitHub or the F-sharp foundation Slack. Or those were clever and could, um, can put one and one together. Um, if you ever need anything F sharp related, toss a coin to your Witcher. That concludes my talk. Many thanks, JetBrains, for having me, and many thanks, everyone, for watching. Awesome. Thank you, Florian. Very nice session. Um, I have a couple of questions from the audience that you may be able to answer. Um, and let's start with a, I hope, easy one. Uh, which is, is there any significance to the intendation coloring that you have in Rider? Um, it's a, well, it helps in a visual tool because F-sharp is indentation sensitive. So it's um, it's just a plugin I use that works for multiple languages, but I found it yeah helpful. Then you can see uh, how that works. So um, this is nothing Rider related, just a plugin I like to use. So I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, I think so. Which plugin is that? Is that Rainbow Brackets or? It's not Rainbow Brackets. I think it's Rainbow Indentation. Let me go quickly check that out. Indent Rainbow, that's the one. All right, cool, thank you. Um, some other questions. One is the question about whether it's possible to use Phantomas on a CI server uh, for a team code style check. Yes, a very interesting question. Um, I actually have like a little example that let me uh, most likely over here. So Phantomus can also be, yeah, this is 
this is like the trivia tool. This is uh, this tab, which used to be its own um, product. And if I go to my GitHub Actions, let me zoom in a bit. I have this build file when I call one of those fake builds. So we run our whole CI CD process in, in the build file. And if I go over there, um, there's something you can do that's possible in both the command line tool and in uh, the fake helpers. If I go to there, there's this thing called um, check code format, which you can call the public API fake helpers check code. And this returns an error code if you um, if some file isn't formatted correctly. So it, it formats everything, and then it checks if there was any change in uh, before and after. And it throws exit code 99, I believe, um, if, it, uh, if, it, if one of the files needs, um, needs to be formatted. Or if, I were, if I were to go over here, so just using the Phantom CLI with a the help, there is Phantom Yeah, there's a check flag over here you can pass. So that does the same thing. All right, cool. Um, then the other one is, can PhantomS format code that won't compile? Uh, yes and no. Yes, in the way that it, if the syntax is okay, it can uh, format it. So um, let's go back over here. If I say uh, let A is B, um, we do not need to know if B exists that can, because the syntax is okay here, the f -sharp compiler can make an AST of it and it can, um, well, it can process the AST regardless of whether this, this will actually compile or not. So that's yes. Uh, but there are scenarios where if you, it's, it's unlikely people will, will get to this, but if you do like A and B, and if you then say not A over here, Uh, if you were to have like these kind of constraints that don't really make sense, um, Phantomus won't be able to puzzle back everything together. And that's one of the things that um, even if, well, in some conditions it is valid code, Phantomus needs to be able to um, reconstruct every code path. And if it's unable to do that, it will fail. But your, your code as a general, as general guideline doesn't need to compile. If it's syntactically okay, it's, uh, it should be okay. All right, nice. Uh, and then the last question that I have here from the audience is uh, is a bit longer, um, and it starts with a premise. The premise is that many formatting tools these days uh, are opinionated and do not provide any way to configure them by design, just like Phantom S. Um, so the developers don't have to spend time worrying about which coding style is the best and can focus on the code style itself. What do you think about that? And have you considered to um, not have a code uh, configuration in uh, Phantom S when you were designing it? Uh, yes, well, I sort of shifted um, in my opinion on that. Um, it would have been nice if there were just like no settings and it's what you get, but it's a bit late in the game. Um, for example, if we, if we have like records like this, um, you can format uh, codes like that, but you can also put the brace over here, or you can even do something else. So there's just a lot of room for interpretation. And if Phantomus were to be released, the, the first ADF Sharp compiler uh, comes out, that would definitely be the way forward. One, uh, one set of rules, that's how we format, and that's kind of what Elm did. So I think Elm has, has very little option and has very little room for settings. If I want to push in that direction, it's just been too late because people are, are used to different things. Um, G Research is a good example. They've just been doing stuff for, um, they've been formatting differently for a lot of years. So it doesn't really make sense to say, no, we're doing this opinionated. People just won't use the tool. Um, there, there are still a couple of um, choices that do adhere to some style guides, but don't fit in what other people are used to. And then people say, yeah, it's nothing for me. So um, the Phantom audience is a tough one by, by times. So 
a bit. Configuration is good. Too much is getting out of hand. Um, it's it's about uh, finding a balance there. All right, makes sense. Uh, yep, yeah, I guess we can wrap up here. Uh, thanks again for presenting.